All right, everyone can hear me, right? Yeah. Yes. All right. Yep. Cool. Um, all right. I think I would just like go down the line here. Um, so this first one, uh, barbells, they give you um, like a list of, of bar weights and a list of plate weights. And you want to know um, which possible uh, combinations are which possible weight combinations can be reached given that the plate weights must be like perfectly balanced on each side. Um, all right, let's see. Let's not miss any of those admits. For, um, for this problem, um, once you find like all the combinations of, uh, of plates that, that work, that balance out. Oh, yeah, like it does all the work. You really yeah. talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks for muting. Um, all right, so once you find the all the combinations of plate weights that work, then it's it's pretty simple from there. You just you just do like every every bar times every um or by every plate combination. But the hard part is getting all the plate combinations that work. Um, let me break down like some of these some of the sample here. So you have like the bars that weighs like 100. There's one that weighs 110. We have like weights like 55146. Five, so like one example could be you have five on each side. So that would add 10 to the bar. And that's why you would see like, you know, like 120 here and, uh, and like 110. And another example could be, you know, five and one makes six. And then you also have a, a six to, to pair with that. So that adds 12, and then here you could see like 100 plus 12 is 112, 110 plus 12 is 122. Um, so that's the, the the general idea is to pair these up. And there's like a um, couple of different ways you could implement this. I like to um, talk about like this um, bit mass idea because it kind of fits pretty cleanly with this problem. Um, if you're not familiar with bit mass, it's pretty much just representing like a combination of like possible like you take it or don't as a as a binary string. Uh, so here I have kind of kind of like the sample, but not quite. Um, this list of plate weights, and here like this binary string is representing that like there's you know we take this first plate that weighs five, this one that takes one this one that weighs 10. So the total weight of these three plates is uh, is 16. And um, the slightly uh, tricky part to this is that now when you want to take plates for the other side, like they can't be plates that you've taken before because you know they're they would already be placed on the one side. You can't place the same plate on both. And you can still use the kind of bit mask idea for this. You can see, look at like a, at all the places where you you didn't take the weight. You can imagine that that is kind of like a like another set of possible things to take, and then you can make a bit mass for that as well, which is what this here is on the bottom, which means like you know we just didn't take this plate again, but we took this plate now, this four plate, this six plate, and then this six plate, and um. You know, both of these actually add up to 16. So this would be like a possible combination. But, um, you know, if you, when you're trying stuff and like, it's like, yeah, this, like one would be 16 and then the other would be 21. And then, then you know, that wouldn't be a valid combination. Um, so you want to count like how many possible, like the mess do you need to check? It's, um, it's kind of like, it's like, um, like a base three number of sorts because it's either, like you take it the first time or you take it the second time or you don't take it at all. So there's like three possibilities per plate. And um, when you check that out, you know, nearly 5 million and that will definitely run in time. Uh, so any uh, questions about this problem? Oh, there's also something in chat. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Would it make the most sense to represent those as like a zero, one, or two? So like zero maybe being the left, one being the right, two being neither or something like that? 
Um, or are you doing a actually, are you doing like a subset with bit masks and then for every for every yeah, item you don't take then you do like a, a subset of that i might um i might show this here and then oh, actually i can do this first new chair this and then i'm gonna increase the Oh, you did do it with the bits absent list. Wow, that's really interesting. That's actually how I did it during contests. Yeah. Like this. But it seemed like a lot of the other students who solved it, they used they used a zero, one, or two, where like a zero represented uh, neither side, a one represented the left side, and two the right side. And if all the items um, on the left like equaled all the items on the right. Uh, the sum of those, like then yeah. it would be a valid so selection. That, yeah, that, that's like the right idea, but I think it's a little bit annoying to to implement uh, compared to just doing uh, two bit mass, just because of like you know binary operations and things. So it's a yeah, so I have mass. like yes, yeah, so like I have my first bit mass, which is like which are the plates I'm going to take, and I have a list of all the things I didn't take. And then I make a bit mask for all the things I didn't take and, you know, try taking them or not. And, you know, um, this is like the, the sum for the first one. This would be the sum for the second. And I just check like that. And I throw all the possibilities into uh, into a hash set just because there's there could be duplicate uh, duplicates. Yeah, it seems like a great way to do it. Actually, I, I didn't use a for loop. I did like the uh, recursion brute force method. <laughs> and so I had like two <laughs> different uh, two different recursive methods that call each other. It was terrible. So I think this is a great way to do it with the yeah, bit mass. Do you have, um, yeah, if you can like iterate over, over bit mass, that's usually um, an efficient way to do like um, take it or don't kind of things. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, um, so for for the iteration of the bit mask, um, you have bm like for like for that first for loop bm one is less than one left shift p. What right. is uh what is the p in the context of the problem again? It's like the, oh, the how, many, how how many plates there are. Wow. So how does that? So it's one left shift all. Wow. Yeah. So one one bit shifted p. That means that like I I shifted one p time. So there's like p is zeros after this one uh -huh. to the power and of then <laughs> i'm doing like one less i'm going up to one less than that which is equal to just all of those being one wow that's i've never even <laughs> seen that. Really yeah jordan like you remember that if that there are always like two to the n subsets of n things so well, i don't is, is like, it set, for the wait, is it for like to, it does it iterate two to the uh P minus like one yeah, exactly. P. Does it so, so it's two to the two to the P minus one times the loop will go around. Oh really? Well, okay. except that you do start at zero. So Oh okay. Two to the P. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's two to the P. Okay. And then there's two of those. Yeah. And then yeah, I do I do this again. Like I know how many things are absent. So that's like the things I'm doing combinations over here. Oh, okay. So you just count how many weren't used. Yeah, and, and just then... like just keep track of like what they were. So I can do this. So if you didn't use it on the left side, you could go ahead and try to use that those on the right side and see if you get like a sum that matches what you used on the left. Yeah, exactly. Just try everything and then see see what matches. So where's the like take it or leave it part? Like is it in a, is that all in like a function where you pass in different it's a it's a little more abstract um but like every single uh binary string here i'm gonna switch back to um my little google drawings here um the take it or don't is represented by the zeros or ones in the in the binary string mm. and so um so yeah, like so, so every mean, single I... binary string is like a complete story of like what you took and what you didn't. Oh okay yeah as it counts up it would naturally because it's one left shift p it would naturally like hit all the different combinations as it just counts up. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Oh uh, okay okay. And then um cool. oh I guess I should 
That is really cool. I guess I probably should. There's one more thing I want to point out for for this. Uh, there it is. Is that um, when you check whether like a like a bit is there, uh, it's a little bit weird. But like I. Yeah, yeah. You I, won left shift. Yeah, bit shifted by the amount, and I and it. So, if this was a one in this position, then this would be at not zero. It would be you know one bit shifted i. So that's how I see if something is there. Um, this is like kind of uh, uh, useful because it like it makes it simple in the sense that like it cancels out everything else that you're looking at. But um, I think in this case it really doesn't matter. Uh, well, anyway. Okay. Cool. Okay, so for the next one, which was it? All right, uh, a buggy robot. I may not have this open. Yeah, I'm just going to open it. <laughs> so this problem, you have um, a 2D grid, and it's it's filled with um, you know empty cells or block cells, and then there's also the the starting location for the robot, which is designated by R, and the exit, which is designated by E. And uh, you're giving this the sequence of moves, um, but the moves may or may not cause the robot to go to the end. And you're tasked with you know fixing the string so that it will. And there are possible changes that you can do is either insert a command anywhere, or you delete a command anywhere. Um, so with with this, you can um, represent. Uh, this idea of like having to make like operations as um, well, you have um, states that I'm going to talk about first, I guess, um, when you're trying to tra transverse the um, the whole map, and it would you know part of your state would be you know where you are in the grid, and uh, so that would be like row and column, which are up to fifty, and then the next one would be where you are in the string of instructions. And the way that that works is that um, when you do an operation like an insert or a delete, um, that costs uh, that costs like um, you know one one operation to do that. But what doesn't cost an operation to do is to just follow what is already here. So with that, um, if you keep track of just where you are in the grid and also where you are looking at the instructions, that's kind of like a complete representation of what you need for um, how much it's, how much is going to, how many further operations are required. And then this is, um, <clears throat> this is possible with um, like a, you know, a priority queue. You can keep track of the lowest cost state and pull that out. Uh, but there is a kind of like smarter, not smarter, but like a like a faster way of well not faster in the sense that it has better runtime <laughs> which is a, a zero one bfs um i probably should have showed this earlier but yeah um this was just to show like the grid um as you know the row and columns and then you know the instructions you can you can index them um and have this index be part of your state in addition to like whatever row and column you are in. And um, so to go back to to you know zero one BFS, um, it's called a zero one BFS because you either have things that cost zero or cost one. And the way that you can do that is with a a double ended queue. You can um, go like well if it costs zero, just put it on top of the queue. So I'll do it immediately next. And if it costs one, just put it at the end of the queue, and then I'll get to it when I get to it. Um, and then you can follow this, and you just need to check, you know, when you're at the end, and then that would be like a possible exit state. You don't have to worry about like remaining instructions or anything else. Um, there's also some kind of implementation things that are a little bit odd about this problem, is that like you can take, you can take an instruction that doesn't do anything. So like say like. The robot is at the starting location, and there's like a, a down. You can take this down 
even though it doesn't do anything, like the robot will walk into the wall, but stay in the same place. So that can be a bit weird uh, in your implementation. But um, the most important like part of this whole like state thing and keeping track of the states you visited and such is that when you pull a state off of your queue or of your zero one BFS, that um, but you know you'll you'll mark it as like you know you know I visited a state if you haven't visited before, but if you have visited that state before, you do not want to um, add anything else to your queue. Um. So if you're say if you're you're using the, the zero one BFS and um, you know if you're adding stuff with with zero to to it you can you know maybe you could do mark it as visited then like you know so you don't add it back in again but for the other things uh, the things that are one cost you can't actually mark it as visited when you put it into your queue uh, because you might get like um, a way to do that with cost zero later. Uh, and if you kind of maybe you try to just keep it like that, you know, I'm just gonna mark it as visited. Don't go to stuff I've already visited before. That's not going to be sufficient. There could be a kind of like um like a growing mass of of states that have like the same kind of cost, and like those are like cause like more states of like the next cost on your next iteration through your queue. And you have to um you have to say that if you you know, if you visited this exact state before, then like don't don't add anything, or else you're gonna get TLE. It's kind of weird that you you have to do it in that way where you you mark it as visited, or like you don't do anything if you visited and you you don't do anything when you visited it, as opposed to just like not putting it into your queue, um, which was a bit uh, different for me because I usually like to do it the other way. <laughs> All right, so uh, questions about uh, buggy robot. So how do you know what command is a one cost or a zero cost? Oh, right. Uh, so the, um, so let's say like, you know, your state is, uh, you know, row column index in, in your array. So if you're doing the zero cost operation, it's like your row and column becomes, you know, whatever the result of doing your action is. And then your index gets plus one, like it goes to the next step. Um, if you're doing a delete operation, then your row and column stays the same. You don't do the thing, um, but then you still go to the next index. So it's like you uh, you commit the index and you get to stay still, but then yeah, then that costs one. And then the insert command is like you uh, you inserted a command. Um, like before whatever whatever this index is. So example, you could, well, this one is a bad example, but uh, I don't know. let's say you wanted to move right, not using this. <laughs> then you could, uh, you know, increment your, your row column appropriately um, and then stay at this same spot in your instruction index. And then, yeah, and then, then again, that would cost one. And those are the those are the three possible things. So you know, two two of them cause you to move to the next index, uh, and you know, two of them cost one, but not the same two. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean by two of them? Like two, uh, two of what? Two, two of the two of the three possibilities. And so the three possibilities is one: your index doesn't change, so it's a, it's a one cost operation because. It was just like running into a wall or something. Two, your index does change, but only by one. And then three, it it changes, but it's but it's still a one cost. Or wait, but it's still a um, one cost because it was like inefficient. Yeah. I'm not I'm not sure if I'm understanding correctly. So let's say. Like you have, you have all the possible like you know move directions. You have you know up, up, down, left, right, and for the three possibilities, I think I might regret putting these in the same text box, but we'll see. So for like one, it's like you do, 
you know, some some move. And then like, you know, no, like no instruction. I shouldn't put parentheses, I guess so I'm going to do it like this. And uh, I'll just do this. Increment. So this is this is inserting. Like you take you take one of these four things, you do it, and then you know I could happening whatever. Um, in this case, like it's never useful to to go into a wall, and like waste a waste a move to to do that that that's not free. Um, but you know you don't even need to like optimize that in your code. It's just um, you can just be trying everything. Okay, so this is this is insert. Would we say it costs zero to go from that starting point to the box to its right? It would if you use the instruction. If you use the instruction to do it, and we have to make a choice of like whether or not to use the instruction. Yeah, that's right. Oh, is that is that the uh, one or zero BFS? It's like use the instruction, don't use the instruction. Is that what that references? Um, no, it references the the two costs of of operations. Oh, okay. So, like you know, follow instructions. So this this has the increment on it, and this is like, I'm still trying to, follow, I'm still trying to understand it too. Cost zero. But like Jordan, if the, we uh, sim yeah, these are these are the three possibilities. So yeah, the insert and delete cost one, and then following it costs zero. You can see that you know two of these things will will increment your instruction, but like one of them doesn't. And whatever your row and column, you know, ends up being depends on you know what you chose here or what the instruction was that you took. Okay. And is it like? Is that how we set up the graph, or is the actual search going to ask those questions like on each iteration? Um, you'll be like trying all these possibilities for every iteration, and then like the um, like you know again, I'll just like put it here, like your states. So could we maybe look State at the very like first whatever row you're on, whatever column you're on, and whatever instruction index you're on. So these would be the things that you're putting into your 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 you know priority queue or your zero one BFS queue, and these have like these have a, a some costs associated with it to get to the state. So but it's um, the cost to go to like yeah. all four directions, and then you pick which cost is the smallest. Right. Okay, um, so for like the very first example, you have like the the robot in the top left. So you would say, like it costs. Does it cost zero to go to the right since that's like already an instruction? We can follow that instruction. Yeah, you can do that, but it changes your your state in the way that this index is incremented. So the other one where you you move with no instruction increment um, is a different state, and so you would you would consider both of those states. Um, you know, like that the first one that you get there with cost zero doesn't. It's actually a different state than getting there with a different instruction index. Wow. Oh, so our graph isn't going to have like eight items in it. It's going to have a lot more. Yeah. Um, so this is, you know, there's 50 rows of, of the grid, 50 columns, and the instructions can also be 50. So there's, there's 50 cube total states. And each one of those is a node. Essentially, yeah. Hmm. 
Um, any more questions about uh, Buggy Robot? Okay, moving on. As easy as uh, CAB. So with this one, you're given uh, a list of words and you're told like you know there's some letter that is like the, um, the maximum like level lexicographical letter uh, among these to tell you it, just like how many letters there are. And then, um, oh yeah, this is just how many words there are. And the, they tell you that this is um, already in lexicographical order, you know, alphabetical order. Um, or at least it should be. There are some like possibilities where, you know, it could be inconsistent. Like there's no possible ways of ordering the alphabet for which it works. Um, and that is, I glossed over this. You don't actually know what the alphabetical order is. Um, all the letters could be like, you could have like an, an alphabet and they imagine you just like swapped all the positions of all the letters in the alphabet. And that would be like a, another possible uh, ordering for the letters. And um, with this, like, it's like, you know, you're considering those possibilities. And um, with your output, there's like three possibilities that there's exactly one alphabet that works. Uh, in which case you you print out the the alphabet uh, in the order, and then the other another one is that it's incomplete. So it means that it's like it's um, there are like you know multiple alphabet alphabets that um, that could satisfy the information that we're given, like the list of the the words in order. And then the the last one is like inconsistent, that it's um, oh yeah, no alphabet will yield it. And um, well, this this example is inconsistent because like um, if you have words that are prefixes of one another, then like the small like the the shorter word should come first alphabetically, which is why this one doesn't work. And uh, with this one, you can see. Okay, I'm gonna get into um, how you how you compare letters. So I guess I should maybe start with the first one here. If you're comparing stuff alphabetically, um, to find out like the order, you have to like, you know, you know, first scan through all the letters that are the same and then find the first letter that, that doesn't match. And then you compare those. So in this case, it's like, it's, uh, it's A because they, they match with C. So C doesn't, the first letter with C in both of these doesn't tell you anything. Um, but when you look at the, the next letter in the second position, there's an A and a D. And since the since cab is before CDA, that means that the letter A comes before the letter D in the um in the ordering. And then you could repeat this logic here, where like you know, the first letter here of C doesn't doesn't tell you anything, but then the second letter again tells you something like the D is is uh before C in the alphabet. And then finally in this the last set here, like C is um doesn't match the first letter of the last word here, which is B. So this tells you that, that C is before B. And then you know if you put those four pieces of information together, you can construct this uh back again. But this one, this one is impossible because we see that A is before B and B is before C, and then C is before A. So this we have this like kind of a loop. Of, of things that don't make sense to be a loop. And uh, that's why this one is impossible. So um, an observation with, with this problem um, is that you only need to compare like adjacent words to, to get everything you need to know. If you have like, um, Let's say, maybe I change this to an A for a second. Right, like if you wanted to like know the information of like, like, oh, this A 
comes before like C, um, you don't need to look more than like one across because it's either going to be the same or it's going to be the piece of information that tells you the ordering. And so you can have like maybe like um, like a list of some things all in the same position. But then like eventually you're going to have like something different. Maybe I'll also put like something different here. But you only get information from the, the, the bits that are different. And you can see these just by looking at the adjacent um, the adjacent positions. And there's always going to be like one exactly like one position that tells you information, like the first part where the first part where it's different. Um, and then you can kind of apply that same logic to like every position uh, still, because if you are doing useful operations on it. Then it must be like they, that they share like the same prefix. If like this, like you know, this comparison matters. All right. So when you first go through this, like like a good way of like representing it um, is with a graph. So here I have some nodes, and we can like follow through like comparing the words side by side. Like here, we kind of actually already talked about this, but yeah, A comes before. D. So you can maybe draw like an edge from A to D. We see that the D comes before C. And then that that C um, C comes before B. And you can kind of see that like the alphabet is like like one um, whole like line of nodes here. And some of the other ones, like we had the cases where it was impossible, like you might see something like this, where like you have like something like go back to A and then like, you know, that that doesn't work. Um, that would be impossible. You could also have cases where it's um, like split up like this. Um, that would be that it's incomplete, like you don't know, the, you know how B compares to A, so you can't say what the alphabet is. Um, so when you go through and then make all of the um, all of the edges of like what comes before what, um, a useful thing to that is to to get the transitive closure, which just means that like you you like make all the extra edges. Um, so you know A comes before D, D becomes before C. So transitively A becomes before C. And then also by the same logic, you know, A, A comes before B. Maybe I should like make these like dotted lines or something. <laughs> ah, whatever. And then the, the last one in this example is, uh, is, is D, like D becomes before C, C becomes before B, so D comes before B. And uh, once you've done this, you can kind of see a, a, a something that's a bit easier to process here. You can see like with these three edges out of A, you see the like these two edges out of D and this one edge out of C and then zero edges out of B. Like it tells you exactly um, the order of, that they appear in the alphabet. And then um, a nifty way of doing this transitive closure is just with with floored warshals, um, because you can have like up to twenty six letters, uh, and you know twenty six letters cubed. That's that's definitely going to run in time just fine. And um, when you look through uh, the result of the transitive closure, you can just see if you have exactly this kind of pattern where it's like you have, you know, n minus one. Uh, you know, things that this comes before and then minus two things, the other thing comes before and see if it, it just lines up perfectly. If you have um, some situations where like you don't know the relationship between two, so like for example, let's just say partially that this edge uh, doesn't exist and you're, you're looking through all the nodes. If you look at uh, two nodes and you say like, oh, there's no edge from A to D, and there's no edge from D to A. 
that would mean that you're you're missing information um, that not even the transitive closure could find. So that means that you you don't know if there's a possible answer. And then with the other case, it's just um, if it if it if it's not the case that you if you're not missing any information but you still don't have the pattern, then it's uh, then it's impossible. Um, so any questions about this one? Could you um, revert the edges so that like to go back to the graph we had in, at the beginning? Uh, so like yeah. a, it was e. this like uh, elbow shape. Yeah. Um, so like for those of you who aren't familiar with Floyd Warshaw's, this one could also be solved with a basic topological sort. So if we're given this graph here with these three edges, if there's a valid way of ordering the graph such that we can make it from like A to B without any cycles, um, that would be a valid alphabet. Yeah, there's like some kind of trickiness with um, using a topological sort. And the trickiness is you have to distinguish between something being impossible and something being um, like having um, incomplete, like you don't know, I think there's multiple possible answers. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely like, it's definitely doable, but it's, um, it's definitely more difficult, I think. Like doing the, doing the topological sort um, wow. to find the stuff is like easy. But then like when you have to go and figure out like, is this impossible or incomplete? The the checks that you have to do are very ad hoc and like, um, you know, and there's a lot of like tricky cases, like you have separate components. Like you could have one component that's like a line uh, like this and then another component that's like a loop. Um, so yeah, it's a, uh, it's possible, but I, I would, I would recommend doing the, the Ford Warshall's one. I mean, what do you think about this? I was able to find, um, I was able to find cycles if my queue was ever empty. And if my queue ever had more than one item in it, then I had multiple possible alphabets. Yeah, but if, you, wait, if your queue is ever empty, but if you have like a loop somewhere, like say like this, come on. Did I select it? All right. Maybe like uh, that is not a loop. There's I should just draw this the other way. way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, like this, let's say. Um, in this case, like, you know, your queue would start with A. Um, it would get that one just fine. But then your topological sort, like you would never go to D. That's right. Like your, so your, you, queue would, your queue would, your, you would never, um, you would never visit these three nodes. So if but you iterate you, uh, four times, you'd have like an empty queue because you would never be able to put D in it. So you'd have like a, you'd right, have an iterate. But you could also have like a case like this uh, where you just have two separate things and then you go to A, like a goes to D, but then like these never go into your queue either. But it's like the other thing. It's not, in, it's not impossible. It's just incomplete. Okay, so in this case, yeah, A and C would both go in queue the queue. Checking if is empty is not enough. And then if, if A and C both go in your queue, like if you ever have more than one item in your queue, then there are multiple alphabets, it's incomplete. So you have multiple nodes with zero uh, in degrees. Um, right, but yeah, there is, a, there is a way of doing it with um, a topological sort, but yeah, it's just, I'm just saying it's tricky. <laughs> No, I think the Floyd Warshaw's way is interesting. I never thought of it that way. Um, but I just, I was, I was able to AC the contest and I didn't find that the edge cases were very difficult. So I started mentioning it. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. Like I, uh, I, my guess is that, is that they put that problem on the, on the, uh, on the set this week because we had recently talked about topological sort and I think it's doable and like based on what we had, had lecture on. Oh, there was a lecture in topological sort. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I wasn't aware of that, but that could be the case. Yeah. Actually, they don't. I haven't really been in the loop in terms of why they pick sets that much. 
Actually, rather, it's, it's, actually, rather, it's more like I'm not in the loop with what the lectures are. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure it's on the learn set for topological sort. Um, and then, yeah, okay, I'm going to skim over some questions. Um, gravity is this uh, implementation kind of question where um, you have these, these circles, which are O's um, that are falling down, uh, but like they can be blocked by these. And the, the bounds are small enough that you can, you know, just, um, you know, iterate over it. You could do like, um, you know, 100 cube just fine. Um, so is, any questions about this one? Okay. Uh, this one, this one is just printing the, um, a number of equal signs equal to like whatever number this is. Like this is like the banger of the set, I would say. <laughs> All right, so skipping over that. Islands, yeah. So with this problem, you have uh, this grid of land or water or, or cloud. And the cloud means that like it, it could be land or water, but you don't know which. And what they want to know is, you know, what is the minimum number of islands uh, that are possible? Um, so in this first example here, it's just all clouds. The way to get the minimum number of islands possible is just make it all water, then there's no land, then there's zero islands. And then with this one, there's um, there's a, like, a, like lands on the corners here and there's clouds here. Um, and there's one island. The way you get the one island is that you you make these clouds land. And then you have one island of size four that's like, um, can't do like this. The the islands are, you know, connected by the uh, the things that are, you know, above them, down them, left and right of them, um, like they mentioned here. So, um, an observation to this problem is that um, with the sections of land, like if you or if you have land somewhere, it um it is always optimal to to turn all of like the clouds like next to it into land because you already you already have at least one island from this land, and adding more land uh, attached to that land can possibly like connect multiple uh, land areas like in this example. Um, so for for your solution, you can go through and just look for all the places that they are land, and then um, you know do a flood fill out from there, uh, going over all of the clouds and the land, you know marking all the ones that um, that you visited, and then um, you know counting out how many times you had to go to a new section of land that you haven't seen before. Uh, any questions about uh, islands? Okay. Actually, how do I say this? This is like the one with um, with stars, <laughs> with the uh, varying Penopes. degrees of of brightness. Penopes. Okay. Penopes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Or or, or panoptes. Panoptes. <laughs> panoptes. I, I'm just I just gonna avoid saying it, I guess. You can just say pee pee because it's project panoptes. Pee -pee. Panopides. Like, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. That with the with the pee pee problem here. <laughs> you have a number of, of, of stars and you're kinda like you're like observing um these like uh, like actually it's just one star, um, this one system. And um, there's planets that are orbiting around the star and you can tell that those planets exist because of them blocking out the light from the star. And um, we have like this bit of um, technical information here that if a, if a reading is less than 80% of the average of all readings, then is considered to be decreased. That um, you say that there's something that uh, some planet that was 
in front of it. Um, and we have these readings across uh, multiple days. And um, the thing about planets going around a star is that it's it's periodic. Like they have, you know, some amount of time in their in their year that it takes to go around it. And I guess like maybe this solar system is like really small or something because it takes only days <laughs> for the planets to come around. But they're interested in, you know, what is the smallest possible um, period, like the, the planet that is going to be like the, like the closest to the sun? I guess I, I'm not accounting for like elliptical orbits versus uniform orbits or whatever, but <laughs> let's just say that the one with the shortest period is the one that's the closest. And so you're looking for, you're looking for a pattern of these decreased portions. Um, you say, I think in this one, it's uh, highlighted, right? It's two, okay. Uh, What was this one again? You have like this on four and then plus three to get to seven here and then like plus three to get to 10, but then like 13 doesn't work. I think this was a sample, right? It was five. Oh yeah, so like it goes to, it goes four to nine to 14. So when you're um, doing this problem, um, when you consider that um, there's only a thousand um, observations that lets you to do uh, n squared. Um, so in this case, n squared could be um, for every possible like like every possible answer, like every possible period, uh, what are all, like all the different like positions that that could do that? So like if you're looking at um a position of like size three, uh, like I was earlier, uh, you could look at you know these first three starting ones, and then you could um for each starting location you look through all the things by like you know adding the period each time. So, you know, one to four to seven to 10, like I did. And then you would also check, you know, two to five to eight to 11. And you can, you can try like every, every possible way that there could have been a period of size three uh, with this kind of method of just all the possible starting locations that cover all the possible days. And then there are you know, up to n possible periods. If your if your period is um, you know, larger than or even equal to n, then it just um is like guaranteed to work. Like if you have uh 15 days and you want to check the period, like you go to day one and then like 15 days later is like outside of your <laughs> your op your uh, observations. Um, so that would work, and it is valid to have a period of size one. So your answer is never going to be um, is never going to be more than n. And um, yeah, you can just try every um, every possible starting location, every possible period, and just check and just keep track of which one is the smallest. Um, questions for that's for just like a double problem? for loop. Yeah, exactly. The maybe the, the interesting bit is like checking all the starting locations. Um, because like you don't need to check like if you're checking for three, like I was talking about earlier, like you don't have to check four as a starting location because like one already covers it. And actually it would be incorrect to check for four in case like that, like maybe one was the not a decrease day and then like four and onwards was. You'd probably TLE if you tried every single starting place. Um, yeah, you would, I think. Because now well, like it's not it's not n squared anymore <laughs> because um, if you're you're checking like the same thing multiple times per for each period now. 
which is but the runtime is kind of weird. Like it if might you're checking, it'll be fine actually. Like if you're checking, it would, it would, it, but it would be wrong. It would be wrong. Even if it didn't TLE, it would be wrong. <laughs> if you didn't loop around, if you did that and loop around, maybe it would be TLE. <laughs> All right, um, more questions? Okay. All right, and periodic strings. This is kind of a, a similar problem in the sense that you can just try all the, the possible combinations. So in this problem, you have um, a string and they're looking for this um, this property called like, you know, K periodic. Um, what this property means is that you, if you take K, the size of some string, and then you look at all the substrings that size K in sequence, and they have to be rotations of each other. Um, so in the example here, there's ABC, uh, and then the ne for, for this three, party, three uh, periodic, and then um, CBA, uh, so this is a rotation in the sense that they took C from the back and put it to the front. And it has to it has to rotate exactly that way as well, that the, the last character becomes the first character, um, say, say here. And then the next three, like BCA, you know, the B in, in cab got put to the front. And then here it, it gets back to its uh, original position. So you can... Um, loop through every possible K for the periodic and, and see whether it works or not. Um, you can even just do like the, the string comparisons. Like you could make a make a new string for each compare for each um, comparison that you're doing, like using like uh, substring uh, stuff and have it that way and they'll still run just fine. Uh, questions about periodic strings? Uh, okay. Mishmash socks. So in this problem, you have a drawer of, of socks of different colors. And Fred is kind of weird in that he likes to, to wear socks that are different colors instead of the same color. And he wants to know like how many such pairs can he make? And we're giving you know a thousand different colors, and you just output like whether the maximum number of uh, mismatched pairs um, are possible. Um, so in this case, like um, I guess I call it like there's one red, two blue, or I guess I should say I should say that there's one red, one blue, and two green. Um, so he pairs you know, one green, one red, and one green, one blue, and that's so you get two. And then with uh, this one, there's um, there's seven. So you can see he has like a ton of this one particular color, and then there's, you know, seven other socks. And the, the best he can do is seven because he, you know, he pairs all of these other socks with the one, the one set that he has 10, and then of the three remaining socks, they're all the same color. So he, he can't uh, do better than that. And that's why the answer for this is uh, is seven. So um, when you're checking this problem, um, the thing about um, this sample is it's, it's kind of revealing about um, what actually is the the way of getting like the the optimum side of um, the optimal number of mismatch socks, because um, if you think about like what if there are other like other ways where you you know you couldn't you know just get like um, as many like pairs as there are like socks divided by two uh, you know floored because of even odd, and if you kind of think about it, they're actually isn't really any other way that you wouldn't get that. Um, the way I, I kind of thought about it is like you'd have, you know, it would be always optimal to take like from 
like whatever the maximum size pile is and then the second maximum size pile then like pair those up and then like continue doing that and if you have like even like two two large kind of pairs like they'll like kind of like even out and cancel out and as you continue doing this like you'll have like a larger set of socks that are all like the same maximum that you're kind of taking from as you go along and it um it all kinds of like evens out um hopefully that makes sense um so if you uh if you accept that to be true that um you're either going to get all like the sum of all the socks divided by two or you look at like the case like this where you you match every other sock to one large set and then like you're left with some remainder then that's um that's pretty much just the cases for this problem wait so like it's literally just that's like really short code is that what you're saying yeah it is it's it was just a gimmick yep it's, i'm not there is <sighs> there is one there's one thing that's like an um a trap of sorts or maybe not a trap but like a, a hitch is that there are like a lot of socks <laughs> up to up to a billion per pile. Um, and if you if you sum up, you know, a thousand billions, that's like way more than integer to that max value, and you can overflow your integer and um, not have a sensible number anymore. <laughs> so wait, what were the two cases again? It was just you add them all up. And then divide it by yeah. two or just add them all to the big pile. Yeah, it's yes, exactly. It's either the sum of everything divided by two or it's um, the sum of everything minus the largest pile. Or, or can you then, just do the sum of everything yeah. minus the largest? Or is it or is it is there a like when does it not work to always take from the largest pile? Um that was this case here. I think what most like, people uh, try to do is they look for the largest pile and then they um, and then they like went through and paired up as many socks with the largest pile as they could. And then when that was done, they looked for the next largest and sort of did like a greedy method. And there were no solves on this problem. So I, I want to make uh, there must be some edge case that like people missed. Um, that's probably TLA, maybe. Think, yeah, that if could you try uh, that because you're doing like 10 didn't to the go nine. one sock at a time though. We went like we went down each color. And so like if I went to um, like the second yeah, example, I would like, yeah, I, I that pick can 10 be, of my uh, large and I'd like yeah. pair it up with the one sock and then the two socks and then the one and then the three. Yeah, so trying, like, to, like, um, trying to actually just pair them up um, one by one is, is definitely tealy. And then um, if you're taking in chunks, I guess it's a, it's a bit more tricky to implement that you have to know how much you could take before there's an, like the, um, like the next largest piles, like catching up to the first uh, two. And then like kind of sure and then taking from like the set of. Oh, no, Blake's got a point. I, I um, if you have to like find like the two largest pile and do it one by one each time, it TLEs, but then like trying to do things in chunks becomes like really um, tricky once you start having like, you know, like like three piles are the maximum size and and such, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, so like, do you have any insight on maybe like how you would need to implement that? It's like, um, you know, there are people that solve like, every, this was one of the only unsolved problems on the set. Like, it's just like no one figured I mean, it out. We were, we, were, we were looking at this one during the contest because of that. And like, I think like pretty much everyone like was not using longs. Uh, what? Are you <gasps> no. No way. <laughs> Wait. Why would you need a long though? Oh, because you need the sum of all of them. Because uh, because the answer doesn't fit into a, you know, a sign signed integer or unsigned integer for that matter. Oh my God! I'm changing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait. Let me see. I did the same. That would thing. be insane if that was the case. Wow. Yeah, that's that's yeah. interesting. We haven't had a problem yet this this semester with that issue. 
Um, so yeah, if you, if you don't know, you know, an integer dot max value is, is like two is like two billion, two billion, which is you know two times mm -hmm. ten to the nine. Um, so like like roughly like a thousand thousand times ten to the nine is definitely going to to break an integer. I think maybe like the maximum is actually like five hundred times ten to the nine or something, but still. I just use like a priority queue, and then you just DQ the largest one. Um, but uh, a priority queue wouldn't work. I don't think. Well, you can do in Java. You, you can do collections that reverse order. Oh, and that's reverse weird. the order. So like, <laughs> like if you um because you know, like, because the you know the answer like if it doesn't fit in an integer like you definitely can't do it like one by one, like that would be a TLE. Well, it would it would get chunks like Blake's saying like so like you have the piles and it would just subtract the biggest pile with the like the well I guess actually what I'm doing is subtracting the biggest pile with the like the next biggest pile which actually might not work now that I think about it no I still w8 interesting hmm. but it's literally yeah, just a gimmick it's just literally. <sighs> Like the, yeah, the optimal, the optimal like pattern is to like, like even out like the top set of stacks as you, as you go down uh, and kind of like keep that even. But um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend trying to implement that when the actual solution is, is really short <laughs> or the intent solution is really short. Jordan, we're gonna to need to like go into the lab and like kind of mess with this because like I don't I have no idea. <laughs> like, uh, I think it's better to just stick with greedy observations because, I mean, I don't know. It could, it could, it you know, it wouldn't be a waste of time. I would say to try to 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 do like an implementation of this that doesn't use like the shortcut and actually tries to like pair up like groups together in chunks. Okay. But I mean, I did. I just probably made a mistake somewhere that I need to look through. But I think that I, I mean, think the time. I think the time limit is really harsh, though. So <laughs> I don't know. I guess I can't. Well, we're getting wrong answer. It. Right? Yeah, we're getting WA. Yeah, we, it's not even TLE. One sock at a time TLEs, but we just, we didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. What's like chunks? Like get get to get to TLE and then give up. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> oh, <fine. laughs> well, wait, Blake. Are you taking the next? The biggest and then subtracted by the next biggest or subtracted by the smallest pile? I'm taking the biggest pile and then I'm I'm actually like, maybe this is the wrong approach, but I'm taking the biggest pile and I'm just going through the piles in order and taking all of them until I run out of the big pile. And then, but then you restock the big pile, right? Like, do you have like a running sort of... Yeah, well, then once I'm, done, to, um... once I'm done taking from the biggest pile, I find the next biggest pile and then do it again. Huh. I think you could probably make cases that that break that where after you take all from like the second largest pile uh, to even out the first largest pile, maybe your third largest pile is now so large that it's more than everything else combined. I'm not putting like socks that. back in other piles. No, I'm you're just, always right. removing them, yeah. Right, I'm always removing them. So how would that allow my sock pile to get too large? Oh, um, is he saying like you like then, let's say you had a you had a like a hundred ninety and eighty, mm -hmm. and you go oh yeah hundred's the largest one we're taking from this ninety is the second largest one, we're gonna pair up ninety of those, um then the first pile is is uh is ten the second pile is empty and then like the the third pile is still eighty, and then it doesn't. Oh, but the reality is I could have found more pairs doing it a different way. Yeah. yeah, if you evened it out. Uh, so I should pair up with, should I always pair the largest pile with the second largest pile? No, I tried that. It still doesn't, I, that's what I did. <laughs> so we don't want second or largest and we don't want to pair the piles in order. So once you find the biggest pile, where do, what do I want to pair up with the biggest pile? I think it maybe would, the it smallest would kind of pile. Be like you, um, you would actually have to like look at maybe like the, the top three piles and go like, okay, there's like 190 and then the next largest pile is 80. And it's like, let's try to take from um, these two piles to make it like as close as like as 80 for for each now, but then that doesn't quite work either. Wow. Does it? 
Damn. You get you could take ten. You could could take ten from both, then you would have ninety, eighty, eighty, and then you would maybe repeat the process, and you would take like ten for the ninety, and then you have three eighties, and then you would have to go down and take three from each of those or something as you go back. (laughs) Yeah, it's a it's a it's a little janky, I think. Wow. I'll have to see what the varsity people think about it. <laughs> well, I mean, like, I mean, <laughs> they, would just, they would just do the, the greedy observation with, like, the five-line solution. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so can you clarify what that solution is? So, you, so like, you take, you, you find the largest pile, and that's the greedy yeah, part, uh, part. And then what do you have to do with the largest pile? Here, let me, um, I can share this. My solution I did during the contests. See, you guys are seeing this, right? Um, I started okay. to get the max. No way, that's it. I got the, the sum of everything other than the max. And I either, you know, print out the, um, I think this is actually a complicated. Oh no! Yeah, yeah. This is this is the sum of everything divided by two. Um, the case where like uh, the max isn't too big, and then otherwise it's just you know everything but the max. Does the does the case with the for loop work like all the time, or or no? You need to check if the if the biggest isn't big enough. Um, is that it for, for, that, for which for which solution? You just always printed out some other that wouldn't work. You have to do this the sum of plus max over two. Uh and, yes, yes. Because okay, you could so have like, like we have to figure out if the sum of all the other socks is bigger than the max or not. Yeah. Because that's the only that's the only um this is like the only case where you can't just get, you know, every, every, you know, socked pair down with the exception of like maybe one, if it's odd. Um, this is the case where, you know, the, the max is so large that um, you're left with some leftover socks in the maximum pile afterwards. So you don't have to repeatedly find the max pile. You only have to find the max pile once. Right, because you're um, you just go like I I know that um, if there isn't any case like um, where the max is larger than everything else, and I can just I can just get everything, like it'll it'll work out. I don't have to know exactly what those pairs are. I just know that it does work out. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> And some other is is the sum of all the socks except for the max, or is no? It's yeah, the sum of all the- I, I this is a a little bit kind of weird with like looking for max with sorting it. But when I sort it, it makes it that um everything but the last element is all the other stuff. Oh, that's why you do minus one. Okay, so the sum of all the others. Yeah. So if it's greater than the max then yeah then in the best case you can only do wow okay that divided by two and then otherwise you just the sum of all the other ones is the amount you can make the amount of pairs you can make um well so you're pairing all of these some other ones with socks and max so these are the number of pairs it's just that you all the other socks are in the max one so Oh, if max is smaller than all the other ones, then those are the only ones you can make. Huh? You can't pair up like some of the smaller ones with themselves. I guess that doesn't help you. Um, it would never help you. Wow. Thank you. That helps. This is good. <laughs> I know you probably don't prefer to show it because like, people have salt, but we're not screenshot. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. We got uh, two left. So it takes three. Um, in this problem, you're given like three rectangles, um, and they just you know they give you width and height, width and height three times. 
And then what you want to check is whether they can be forming, they could be placed to form a square and you're allowed to rotate the pieces. So with this example here, um, you can see how they, they put these three rectangles together and they made a square. Um, with this problem, um, you first need to think about like, you know, so this is like one possible way of, of putting things together, like how many possible, um, how many possibilities are there for, for making a square? Um, so I have a little bit of examples here that I'm gonna break down. So this one, this this case is what I'm gonna call it. Um, is like is like the case in the uh, in the uh, the problem, which is this one. Okay, let me just close some of these. So you have you see here that the um, there's one like rectangle that um, it shares like um, a side with a square, and it makes like an even division. And then there's like the two other rectangles like split up like the remaining portion. So that's um, that's what what this is um, symbolizing again. Uh, and then another case is uh, where they kind of more like the second rectangle also makes like an even split, like all three of them share um, the side of the square. Um, and you get this kind of, uh, you know, like layered thing. And then if you if you try to do like um, the same thing, but like, you know, vertical layers instead of horizontal layers, that would just be a rotation of this. And since we're allowed to rotate the blocks, we don't have to like actually check that in our code. We can just check for this uh, considering all rotations. And now the question is like, well, could there be other cases um, with this? And I, the way I like to think about that is, um, but first like say like, let's try thinking about placing a square here um, or like a rectangle inside the square and then say like it doesn't, it doesn't form like a complete side. What 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 can we do? One possibility is that um, you place like a rectangle that covers the top, um, and then you would have, you know, something else uh, covering the bottom. And then if you look at that, like the the top being covered, this is the same as this uh, as this case where you have like one side a rectangle, one rectangle with a side of the square, and then the other two like combining to make it. Um, and another case could be like, oh, maybe you put the rectangle like this vertically. Um, well, this is actually just like this, like rotated on its side, where instead of it, you know, the, the rectangle that shares the side with the square being on the top, it could be uh, like on the, on the side of it. And there's really like not anything else you can do with this. Um, like you, you only have two other rectangles and they have to complete the, the square. So if you try to place like another rectangle somewhere that like doesn't like complete it uh, properly, then you're, you're always going to be left with a situation where you, you don't have enough rectangles left to, to fill it. Uh, so those are the only other, um, you know, the, like if you play something like this, you're always gonna end up with a situation like this, if it's going to work out, and then if you, um, you know, if you do place it so that it does match completely, well, if you you place the rectangle so the other two is like don't form layers, then you get this again, and if they do, then you get this. So these are the 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 two uh, kind of patterns that you need to look for, just like this layered pattern, and then this like like like. Um, one plus two pattern, I guess I would call it. Um, so when you're checking this in your code, um, I'll talk about like um, how to check all the rotations in a second. Um, but say like once you have all the rotations, like you're checking one particular rotation, you can just check, you know, do three, do three of the rectangles, share a side, and then does their, um, their sums of their their widths that aren't that side like add up to the the same the same side to make a square. So this is like pretty easy to check. 
And then with this one, you just kind of need to do um, it's like a similar check. Like you, you go check like on maybe like the the first um, you know, rectangle that like matches with a side, and then you check that these two widths like add up to that, and then that this like this part here plus this part over here like also adds up to the side of the square. Um, and since there's only three rectangles. It's actually like not that bad to just um, hard code these in. But uh, yeah, you could also just um, kind of do it like recursively where you, uh, you like you put in the rectangle like flipped or not and and so on and so forth. Um, questions about this problem? Uh, all right, so I'm going to go on to uh, zigzag. So with the uh, zigzag, you have um, the sequence of numbers, and you want to know like what is the largest zigzag pattern. And the zigzag pattern is defined as um, that each number in the sequence like uh, alternates between increasing and decreasing. So this example here, you see like one increases the two, and then one increases the three and then decreases the two. And then you know, one increases the four, decreases the two. These are possible solutions here, like taking this one, this three, and this two. And then you know, one, four, and two. And then two and three and two is another zigzag pattern. Um, yeah, these are all in three. And uh, yeah, and so on, like two, four, two, three, four, two. And you want to know like what is the largest zigzag pattern in the given sequence. Um, and there are like a ton of a ton of numbers in the sequence, which means that you can't do um, you know you can't do like n squared or anything like that. Uh, you know either order n or n log n for this one. So um, with this problem, um, here let me uh, actually make a new one for this. Zoom in a bit. So let's say we have a sequence like, um, let's see, uh, 50, 49, 48, 49, 51, 52, 53, and then 40, 39, 38, and 45, and then 50, 47. Um, so one way to um, form a solution is to first um, like identify like all the parts of the the sequence that are um, you know uh, going in one direction, either increasing or decreasing. So like I can maybe like alternate uh, bold italics or something funky like that. So bold is going to be decreasing. <laughs> then this is uh, this is increasing, and then this is I guess a single one decreasing. So um, if you look at um, all of these sections and you're like considering like numbers to take in your pattern like between these three because if you're if you're looking at um a potential solution and you have the option of putting say like any of these three in um it actually is kind of clear like what would be given that um you're like uh decreasing from somewhere I guess that's a that's another given here is that um if you're looking for a decrease and you're looking at this section, then the the best answer is always going to be like the last one. Um, because if you're if you're doing like a a decrease to somewhere, then the next number that you're picking will be an increase um, out of that. And the best number to go from 
when you want an increase would be the lowest number. So if you're if you're looking for a decrease and you're like um, looking at these three, and I'm I kind of singling out these sections because if if you take like one of these, like you can't you can't take like the um, the other one, right? So like if you take forty and you're you're if you're decreasing, you can't take the, these other two because that would be decreasing twice and you have to alternate each time. So if you have like any solution where you, you took 40 here on a decrease, then like taking 30, 38 would be a better solution than that. Um, like it would, it would allow for possibly more stuff because the next number, which, you know, in this case like 45 is, is definitely going to be higher than 38 if it is higher than 40. Um, so with this, you can kind of go and uh, imagine that you uh, you just take like, the last number in each of these sequences. And then you can see that like, um, this is a this is already a possible answer. That you know it would go from starting at forty eight. Um, it switches from this decrease and sequence to this increasing one, and it goes to fifty three, decreases to thirty eight, and increases to um, to fifty, and then decreases to forty seven. And um, the thing about this is, you try to maybe modify this solution uh, somehow, like. Uh, you can say like, well, you know, maybe, maybe I um, don't want to take this 38. Um, maybe it's better to be, you know, in increasing or um, selecting like 50 with an increase or decrease. Or let's say you're trying to, to switch, like, you know, I don't want to have to be um, decreasing like next after this point. Um, so let's say you take out the 38, and then you can, uh, uh, that's not, control underline. And then you could go like, okay, now I can do uh, like, like 48 next maybe, or like 45 next. Or actually, wait, did I skip? Which was the one for, uh, Sorry, I had an example where, where it looked like taking a number out could get you something. I think with this one, it like clearly doesn't. Well, anyway, let's uh, let's still go with this. So with thirty eight, um, now when you're at this point, like you're no longer. Um, looking for an increase because instead of taking this decrease, you looked for a different one. Maybe it was this one. Um, so you could then say you could take like 45 instead now and then um, be increasing and then like, oh, well, uh, you wouldn't take like this number anymore then. And actually that, yeah, no, that doesn't work. Uh, well, that wasn't the case I was looking at, but um, anyway, I guess I'm not going to be able to get to the um the proof for like why this is optimal, but you could see why um why this is like a possible solution at least. Um, separating all of these out, um, if this is like if this is an increase from this to this, uh, this would um you know this number to this number would definitely be an increase. If this switch from from increasing to decreasing, then this number here is definitely a decrease from this number, um, and you can just uh, go through and and fill those out and uh, and get there. So really, this question is asking for um, like how many times does it change direction um, in the string? So you could just go through and. Um, and uh, just count how many times it switches direction. I think, did I have this one here? I had like a, another solution that I did that was like overcomplicating it at least. Like you could do like longest increasing subsequence 
but like modified with uh, switching, alternating, and down. But it's just, yeah, the actual solution, judge solution is way simpler than that. <laughs> you just see if you're if you switch directions or not, and just count how many times it happens. Um, all right, so comments about zigzag, maybe? Um, all right, well, that will wrap it up. That was the last problem. Um, thanks for dropping by. Yeah, thank, uh, see your chat message, thanks. Thank you, bye-bye. All right.